Hey folks, welcome back. So today I want to talk about a finance topic that is really important to me and always gets to me as a passive investor. And that is even if I'm investing in some kind of passive investment like the S&P 500, which I know logically I should just be putting money in there at some fixed cadence every week or every month and just let it grow over time if the market is any indication, there's still that part of me and I know part of most passive investors that says if I could just time this right, if I could just look out for the bottom of the market, I would make so much more money over time. I would be able to buy at a low price and let it grow that much faster. And so that's what this video is about. This is about can we actually realistically use historical data about the S&P 500 to find these market bottoms? And so we're going to define what market bottom means and talk about all the intricacies and nuances and whether this is even possible and realistic. So let's define some terms first, most importantly market bottom. So here's an approximate graph of the S&P 500 over the last about 12 years, so since 2012. Now you can see that it has high periods, and we'll call those market tops, which are going to be denoted by these green triangles. So here's a market top, here's a market top, and so on. And the things we're going to be talking about today are the market bottoms, and those are pretty much the opposite. Generally periods where the market dips over some extended time before and after, it clearly looks like a dip right, right here. And so those are the things we're going to be trying to predict today. Can we realistically build a model to predict when those dips are going to be? If we could do that, then the treatment would be obvious. We would just buy, we would save up our money that we were going to invest consistently over time. And we would instead, if we knew when those dips were gonna happen or predicted them really well, we would invest exactly at those times. Because if we invest at these times and buy low, then by the time the stock gets to a higher price, we're gonna have a much higher gain than if we invested at some random time like here, for example. Now, if this all sounds too good to be true, I'm going to state many times in this video that it probably is, but that's the general idea. And so let's say we get $100 to invest each week. That's our budget. You can plug in whatever number you actually have here, whether it's less or more. And so we have a couple of different options we're going to be using as baselines today to see if we can train a model that's going to do even better or close to what one of these baselines is doing. And our first baseline is kind of worst case scenario, which is buy at the market tops. And that's kind of the opposite of what we're trying to do. If we were buying at the top of the market, if we somehow actually timed the top of each market and bought there, well, that seems like the worst case scenario because that's going to give us the lowest growth rates over all time. But as we'll see, we have this as one of our control baselines because we'll see even if you were to get super unlucky and buy at the market tops, you still have a pretty good rate of return over time, as we'll see. Now, the other one is that let's say we just knew where the market bottoms were. So we're going to save up our $100. We're not going to invest it until such time that we get to a market bottom that somehow we just know where that is. And so this baseline strategy is going to say how much would your money grow if you were to buy only at those market bottoms. And the last strategy is what the general advice is. Just put that $100 that you get every week, no matter what the price of the S&P 500 is, no matter if you think there's a market top or a market bottom or something going on, you're just going to put that $100 in consistently every week and we'll see how that does. Now this is the real baseline that we're trying to compare against because this is the easiest thing to do. If we're going to train a model and go to all that trouble, we better get significantly higher gains and, and confidently higher gains over time. Now, one thing we need to do here is define what is a market bottom, because we've kind of just talked about it visually, but what does it actually mean? How do I know that that's a bottom, but for example, why didn't I mark this little dip here as a bottom? Well, it seems like generally because that dip didn't last long enough, and maybe that's why, but we need to define these terms a little bit. And the reason that it's important to define them is shown by this toy example right here. So here's just a brief period of, let's say, three weeks. Let's say the stock price starts at $1. Let's say in the first week it dips by 5%. Let's say in the next week it also dips by 5%. And let's say in the third week it goes up by 15%. Now, if we were to define this as a bottom, if we were to define that as a market bottom, then what we would do is save up the, let's say, $100 we're getting every single week. We would not buy it here because that's not a market bottom. We would not buy it here because that's not a market bottom. We would spend all $300 that we've accumulated so far right here, and that $300 would grow by 15%. So our rate of return would be 15% if we did consider this as a market bottom. If we, however, did not consider that as a market bottom, because if we were looking outside of this picture, and if there was not so much indication that there was actually a bottom going on here, if we did not consider that a market bottom, then we would get a 0% gain because we would never actually invest our money because we didn't identify that as a bottom. 
If we were, however, consistently investing our money across these three weeks, so we put in the $100 here, put in $100 here, put in $100 here, just patiently, diligently every week, we would still get a 9.3% rate of return by the time we got to this period right here after the stock goes up by 15%. So this is a toy example, but all this is to say that it's really important the time period we use to define what a market bottom is, both for our Oracle model here, which just somehow knows where the market bottoms are, but also for our machine learning model that we're going to train because that's going to be defining the training data that goes into our model. That's going to be defining what the model is trying to learn in predicting a market bottom. So that's going to be probably the most important axis we'll look at today when we look at the results, which is do we define a market bottom as the lowest price of that stock within six months looking forward and backward in time? Do we define it as looking forward and backward one year? Do we define it as looking forward and backward two years or even shorter, even longer periods than that? And so we'll look at how that changing definition of what a market bottom is, is going to affect our performance under these different strategies. But this is probably a good place to talk about the features that we're gonna be feeding into our machine learning model. So we're gonna revisit this page at the end and this right column called feature importance is blurred out right now because I didn't wanna give away all the cool findings. But these are the features we're gonna use. We're just gonna be using a set of six pretty easy to understand intuitive interpretable features feeding into our machine learning model, which is gonna be a simple gradient boosted decision tree model. The focus of this video is not really on engineering crazy features or having some kind of crazy model. In fact, because we have very sparse labels, market bottoms don't occur like all the time. So it's not really possible for us to use something like a neural network or something like that. So the focus is more on given some kind of reasonable enough architecture, given some kind of reasonable enough set of features that we'll talk about here, can we realistically beat just consistent investing every week? So our six features are gonna start with the growth of the S&P 500 since the last bottom. So this is saying, let's say the last market bottom we identified was three years ago. What has the growth of the market or return of the market been since that last bottom? Now the next one is gonna be the days since the last bottom. How many days has it been since the market was at its last bottom? The next one is a more short-term feature, the one week growth rate or the one week return of the S&P 500. The next one is the days since the last market top. The next one is the volatility in the growth rate of the S&P 500, the volatility in the return over the past month. And the last one is gonna be the growth rate since the last market top. Now that we know the model architecture we're using, we know the features we're feeding in, we can finally take a look at the results of whether or not we can beat just consistent investing with this model. And so all of the results are stored in this little table here. Let's go ahead and figure out how to read it. On these rows, we have the window sized used to decide what a market bottom and a market top are going to be. So what this first row means is that it's defined as a market bottom or a market top. If looking two years back and two years forward, this price was the lowest price in that two year looking back or two year looking forward window. This lower row, six months, means that we only need to look six months back and six months forward. And if that's the lowest price in that plus or minus six months window, then that's considered a market bottom. Now there's definitely trade-offs. You might think that one of these decisions is just always better than the other, but one of the trade-offs to think about is if you use a bigger window, like let's say we use two years, plus or minus two years as a window instead of plus or minus six months, then you're going to have less bottoms to train on. If you think about feeding that into your machine learning model, it's a lot harder to get the minimum price in the last two years and in the future two years so that's just gonna make your label sparsity problem even worse. There's not gonna be a lot of positive examples for your model to train off of. And so the volatility in your model's predictions is going to be higher. But the trade-off there is that the bigger your window is, although that is the con, you get more confidence in those bottoms. The shorter you make your window to define a market bottom, the less you know that's actually a bottom. For example, if you shorten that window to like a month, for example, then you might get this kind of short kind of transitory dip in the S&P 500 over the course of a month. And under that definition, we'd say, oh, that's a market bottom. But if you look at the broader picture here, we could see that maybe it's going up here, a little momentary dip, and then it kind of just continues its upwards trajectory. And looking at that whole picture, we would say, that doesn't really seem like a market bottom there. So that's the trade-off. The longer the window, the less training data we have, or rather less uh, positive labels we have to learn from, but the more confidence we have that the bottoms we find are actually market bottoms. And so on the columns here, we have the four different strategies that we can use. The first two are what we call oracle strategies because they require us to just somehow know the future and know where the market tops and bottoms are before the futures even happened. 
Obviously, these are not strategies you can do in the real world, but they're good strategies to compare what we eventually get to see if we're doing better or worse or about the same as these. The first strategy is just saying, what if you somehow knew where the market tops were and you really wanted to shoot yourself in the foot, so you just bought when the market was at its top? The next one is what seems like the ideal strategy, um, but we'll see that may not actually be true, which is uh, you know where the market bottoms are and you buy exactly. You save up your $100 each week until you get to a market bottom and then you put all the money accumulated thus far into there. The third one here is that consistent one where you just see putting that $100 in every single week. And you see that because that's just the consistent strategy, it doesn't actually depend on your window size. So we get the same return. And this is the return over that 2012 to 2024 12-year window. And the third one here is using our gradient boosted decision tree model, feeding in just those six interpretable features. And what we're trying to do here is predict where the market bottoms are going to be and the return we get here. So now da -da -da -da, we can finally take a look at what models are doing better where. So if we have a two year window as our definition of a market bottom, then the best one is going to be actually just consistent investing, just consistent investing. That gives us 138%. In fact, the model here actually does the worst of them all. I'm not even considering the market top one here. That's just kind of a control that's not really a control. That's just saying what's the worst you could really get here. And well, maybe it's a good place to talk about even in the worst case scenario, we see decent returns. It's not like these are negative or anything. So this first column was just to show that even if you're really, really unlucky, you're still gonna get some kind of positive return out of the market here. But really we're just focused on the uh, latter three columns here. We see that the model is actually doing worse than consistent investing. If we use a one year window instead, we see the model is actually doing way better than consistent investing. And it's definitely the best choice right here. The model is definitely doing better than consistent investing. If we use a six month window, the model is also doing better than consistent investing. But the ideal strategy here, even though we can't actually implement it in real life, is going to be knowing where the market bottoms are and then buying at those bottoms. Ritvik from the edit here. I do apologize. Clearly the model's return of 162 in this case is higher than the 142 I circled. Call it just getting confused in the heat of the moment, but all the discussion that follows doesn't really depend on that choice. Everything should be the same from here on out. So this chart is just to show that it really depends on what you set your window as. If you decide your window is two years, one year, six months, and we could have chosen other things like five years, three months, one month, things in between these ranges here, it seems like it really shifts around which thing is gonna do better. And so the main takeaway really, before we even get to the rest of this video, is that you could use a model and you could do better than just consistent investing. But the other thing that I haven't shown on this chart is what is the volatility around these model return numbers? And what I found is that if you just slightly tweak the parameters or the random seed inside your gradient boosted decision tree model, these things can often be lower than the consistent investing. Sometimes they're even higher than this. So there's just a lot of volatility. The standard deviation that we get from this model's returns are really, really, really high. And in my opinion, not really worth it versus just already the pretty nice gains you're getting over this period via just consistent investing. It's one thing if consistent investing was giving you really poor returns and the model is on average giving you something way higher even though you have to accept this higher standard deviation to get it. But because the model, yes, could do better under very specific circumstances but could also totally do worse under even slightly different circumstances, I would say my opinion here based on the experimentation is that consistent investing is really the way to go here. It just depends on too many factors to feed them into a model, and I suspect this would continue being true even if you fed more features into your model, even if you use some kind of more complicated model architecture. Predicting market bottoms is by nature a difficult problem because there's not like market bottoms every couple weeks. Market bottoms by nature are called market bottoms because they occur on these kind of longer term draws of the economy. And so it's really difficult to know exactly when you're at one because there's not a lot of these things in the past to learn from, even if you set your window size smaller and smaller. Now just for fun, because we did use a gradient boosted decision tree, one thing we can do in terms of interpretability is print out the first tree from the 500 trees that we had in the model. And this is the top of the first tree. It kind of continues down, but I didn't want to overcomplicate the page here. So we see that some of the questions being asked for the tree are, was the growth rate in the past week less than negative 
On the left, we have yes. On the right, we have no. If we go yes, then we ask, is the growth rate since the last bottom less than or equal to 12%? If the answer is yes, then we ask, is the growth rate since the last bottom actually very negative? Is it less than negative 38%? If the answer to that is yes, then the probability that we're at a market bottom, according to the model, is 41%. If the answer to that last question is no, then it's actually almost double. It's 72% here. And so the story there is kind of, if you go again from the top to the bottom down this way of the tree, we're saying that the market has been kind of slipping a little bit in the last week. Yes, that's true. And if we go down here, we see that the growth rate since the last bottom is not too positive. We haven't grown too much since the last bottom. And this is really where the dichotomy happens, looking at these two probabilities. This is saying, was the growth rate since the bottom like super negative? And if the answer to that is yes, then we're probably not at the bottom yet. The model probably think there's more slipping to be done here because the growth rate has already gone down by so much. However, if we have some kind of growth rate since the last bottom between negative 38% and positive 12%, then we've definitely slipped since the last bottom, maybe have increased by a little bit up to 12%. And so it may be time, it's more probable that it's time here for a market bottom. And so that's what's going on here. So this is more to just to get a sense of how the model is thinking behind the scenes, taking a look at what kind of questions it's asking to actually come to its decisions. And now we're finally ready to go back to that feature importance chart and look at which of the six features we used are actually the most important in the model making its prediction. So we see the importance column here is now unhidden and they were ranked all along in terms of descending order. So the top two features seem to be the growth of the market, the return of the market since the last bottom, that accounts for 28% of the overall importance of all the features. And the next one, which is comparable, is the days since the last bottom. So these make a lot of sense to me because if you just look at a chart of the tops and bottoms of the S&P 500 over time, markets kind of happen as we talked about in these economic cycles. And so the number of days since the last bottom makes total sense as a good indicator of when the next bottom might be. And also pairing that with what's the actual growth, the return of the S&P 500 since that last bottom, this story makes a lot of sense. One interesting thing was the third most important feature, although it was significantly less than these first two, was more of a short-term feature. Not really how's the market been doing since its last bottom or in the last several months or year, just in the last week, what was the return of the S&P 500? So this was pretty interesting to me. Don't have a clear theory on that yet, but feel free to leave it in the comments below if you have an idea about this. And then the other features were not ignorable, but they were definitely much smaller in terms of importance. So I think the main thing I wanted to get across in this video is not trying to make any kind of claims about, hey, I trained a model that's doing better than just consistent investing. Although that is true for these very specific cases, I have to be honest as a data scientist and as a passive investor that this has a lot of volatility associated with the numbers that you're seeing in this column here. Although you see this 168% return, which is higher than the 38% return, the volatility of this number is way higher. There's no guarantees you're going to get this. Of course, there's no guarantees that you're going to get the 138 either, but the volatility around that is a lot smaller because it depends on less things. You're just investing $100 into the market every single week, and so there's less moving parts than with the model where you first have to define what a bottom is, what the window size is going to be. You have to decide how you're going to architecture the model, what the model is going to look like, which features you're going to use. So the volatility here, in my opinion, in, my, in this humble data scientist opinion, is not worth just the consistent investing already returns you're getting. And one interesting thing we didn't even talk about was in these first two cases, these first two rows, the consistent investing is already beating the case where you just magically know where the bottoms are. How is that happening? How is that possible? And that gets back to our first example where if we define the bottoms as being really long windows, then it's unlikely that we would actually define something like this as a bottom. And so we'd be saving up our money, saving up our money, looking for that market bottom, looking for that market bottom. And this is parallel to at least what happens to me when I go kind of off track my passive investing and start looking for these bottoms is it's very unclear just looking at a graph if you feel like you're at a bottom or not. And so you just hold on to your money, hold on to your money, and then the market starts going up and you're like, oh man, I missed the bottom. I'm just going to wait for the next one. And But if you were just investing consistently that whole time, you'd be better off for it. So that really, I think, is the moral of the story. But hopefully you did enjoy the effort and the fact that we tried to build a model and it did do well under certain situations. So if you like this video, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day, and I'll see all you wonderful people next time.